Did everyone turn in your homework? If not, you can put it on the stool. Okay. Um, any questions? I have a couple things to mention about the lab. So Abby said there were some questions about like what temperatures to use. So for the first part of the lab, you are trying to determine if um, you can use the lump capacitance method for the spheres. You have the core temperature, and if you can use the lump capacitance method, that means you can use that as the surface temperature. So to calculate the BO number, just like we've done before, you need the thermal conductivity. So for that, you're going to use the just the average of the initial and final temperatures for the thermal conductivity of the, the copper and rubber spheres. Um, and for rubber, I think in the book, maybe there's just like one value. I don't think it gives it as a function of temperature. That's fine. Just use the value that's in the book. Yeah. You said use the start and end temperatures? The average the of average them. And yep. Then, and then that, you plot that line and then that slope and that zero. Is that what you're saying? So you use the start and end temperatures so that you can look up the thermal conductivity. Mm -hmm. so you use the, the average of them just so you know what temperature to look up the thermal conductivity <coughs> of. Um, to look up the thermal conductivity of the spheres at that average temperature, and then you use that to calculate the BO number. And Calculating the effective the H comes later. The where we're getting H not that from the saying. not from the slope of the BO number. Mm -hmm. So it's from the slope of the temperature distribution equation, which is all it's all in the handout. Yeah. So the BO number just tells you whether or not you can use the lump capacitance method. <coughs> Okay, so that's for calculating the BO number. And that's kind of the first part of the lab where you're looking at the experimental results. And that tells you whether or not you can use the lump capacitance method. Um, and then for the empirical part where you're calculating the convection coefficient, you have to um, look up different fluid properties. And those properties vary with temperature. And we're going to talk about, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but in general, when you're evaluating fluid properties to look up um, or to plug into empirical correlations, they're evaluated at what's called the film temperature. So it's the average of the surface and the ambient temperatures. So you're trying to look up like the fluid properties, right? And the fluid properties kind of right at the surface. And the temperature, as we've shown, varies, right? If there's a distribution. Um, so just kind of to get in the ballpark, what is typically done is just taking the average of the surface and the fluid temperatures and just saying, okay, we're going to evaluate the fluid properties at this temperature. That means that because the surface temperature is changing with time, the film temperature is going to change with time, right? So you have however many data points you have, you're going to have to get values for all of those different data points. So you need to figure out a way to do that in MATLAB or Excel that's efficient. You know, write an equation or something based on linearly interpolating in the tables, and then just for every temperature that you have, every surface temperature that you have, calculate the film temperature and then just plug it into the equation, something like that, however you want to do it. But just know that many of those values for the convection part of it are going to vary with time. Okay, questions? This one is a little bit more maybe calculation heavy. There's not any of the sort of like minimization stuff that we had to do in the first one, but you've got three weeks for it. Don't wait until the last week, I would, I would say. Um, start early and ask questions if you have them. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go back into talking about convection. Um, last lecture. We talked about the fact that you have kind of laminar and turbulent boundary layers, usually starting out laminar and then transitioning to turbulence, and how the nature of the boundary layer affects the nature of the velocity and temperature distributions, and how that therefore affects the friction coefficient and the convection coefficient. And we talked about how to calculate whether you're in the laminar or turbulent region, 
um, using this critical x sub c, so you know the x location where transition occurs. Um, and then we introduce the boundary layer equations, which are just the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy equations with assumptions that are appropriate for the boundary layer. Um, so kind of these reduced, simplified forms of the mass, momentum, and energy equations. Um, I want to make a couple of comments about these because the next thing we're going to do is non-dimensionalize them. So we have conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. And we talked about kind of what each of the terms mean <coughs> physically. I want to point out that this viscous dissipation term, this entire term, is often neglected for laminar flow. So the first solution that we're going to do is parallel laminar flow over a flat plate, and we're going to neglect this term for that. So this is often neglected for laminar flow. <coughs> And then I wanted to mention also that these equations apply to force convection at low speeds. And the reason that they don't apply to free convection is because we assumed that all body forces were negligible, right? Including gravity. And free convection depends on buoyancy, um, which we talked about, I think, when we first introdu introduced convection. So basically, you assume that kind of the density of some fluid lower down or higher up is lower or higher, and you get some mixing based on the buoyancy forces, and that depends on gravity. But because we neglected all of the body forces, we're assuming that these equations just apply to force convection, where buoyancy is kind of um, not important. So we're going to start out by uh, coming up with solutions for force convection. All right. So um, there are a couple different ways that you can come up with convection correlations. And one of them, we mentioned that you can solve these equations directly, apply appropriate boundary conditions, and then directly solve for the velocity and temperature distributions. But the main way we're going to go about figuring out convection correlations is by non-dimensionalizing these um, equations and then pulling out kind of important dimensionless similarity par parameters that allow us to come up with a bunch of different correlations to calculate the Neusel number and therefore h at different um, for different geometries. Okay, so let's start doing that. And hopefully it'll make a little more sense as we go along. Okay, so we're going to talk about the normalized boundary layer equations. And we're going to start off super simple, talking about laminar parallel flow over a flat plate. So to non-dimensionalize the boundary layer equations, we first define several dimensionless parameters. <coughs> 
So the kind of base parameters that you have um, in the equations are uh, distance, velocity, temperature, and pressure. So this star from here on out denotes a dimensionless parameter. So we're going to say x star is given as x <coughs> over L. So we're just dividing our um, distance variable x by some characteristic length L for flow over a flat plate. L is typically just the length of the plate. So um, going forward, the characteristic uh, kind of length and velocity and whatnot terms that we use depend on the geometry that we're considering. So similarly, y star is y over L. U star is U over V. And this V is typically the free stream velocity, so U infinity. V star is V over V, which we should probably write this little v some sort of cursive or something so we're not confused. Let's try this, which is not new, <laughs> different from new. And then the dimensionless temperature is going to be T minus T sub S over T infinity minus T sub S. So to non-dimensionalize the temperature, we're pulling in the surface temperature and the fluid temperature. And then finally, we need to make the pressure dimensionless. And we said we're just going to um, kind of assume that the pressure distribution in the boundary layer is equal to the pressure distribution in the free stream. So that's why we've got this P infinity here. So the free stream pressure. And then we're um, non-dimensionalizing it by rho V squared. <clears throat> okay, so we plug these into the mass, momentum, and energy equations, and we're left with um, dimensionless boundary layer equations. So we're going to write out just the momentum and energy um, equations because those relate directly to the velocity boundary layer and the thermal boundary layer. All right, so we've just got these new x star, y star um, variables, and then we can plug them directly into the equations because now x is just equal to x star times L, right? So we have a new expression for x. We plug that into our equations, simplify, and then this is what we get. For the momentum equation, u star, partial u star, partial x star, plus v star, partial u star, partial y star, equals negative dp star dx star, plus 1 over the Reynolds number, second derivative of u star with respect to y star. And then we have some boundary conditions that just come from kind of the geometry that we've defined, right? So we said that the velocity at y equals zero for all x equals zero. So this is just saying, again, the velocity at the surface is zero, the no slip condition, which is what we had previously. And that's the boundary condition at the wall. And then in the free stream, we know that the velocity is equal to u infinity. And we're going to write that in terms of the dimensionless parameters. So now we're saying our dimensionless velocity at any 
x and y equals infinity, so just anywhere in the free stream, is equal to the free stream velocity at that x location, just normalized by um, the free stream velocity to make it, or the characteristic velocity. So for this situation, that would just be 1. <clears throat> but we're leaving it in terms of v because the characteristic velocity is not always the free stream velocity. But for this geometry, it will be. So that's the boundary condition in the free stream. So the important parameter that kind of fell out of non-dimensionalizing this equation is the Reynolds number. So previously, the equation looked like this, right? Where we had everything in terms of dimensional parameters. And by non-dimensionalizing it, we now get this grouping of terms in front of uh, the last term in the equation that we can identify as the Reynolds number. So we'll say the similarity parameters that come out of this similarity parameter is the Reynolds number. And that's equal to some velocity times some characteristic velocity times some characteristic length over new the kinematic viscosity. So I'll go ahead and write this like we did previously to show you that it's the same. And because rho divided by, I think that should be swi switched, shouldn't it? So this divided by this is kinematic viscosity. Okay, we're going to go through the energy equation, non-dimensionalize that, and then we'll spend a little time talking about why these dimensionless parameters are really important and how we're going to use them going forward. All right, so the energy equation, which gives you information about the thermal boundary layer. Note that we're going to neglect viscous dissipation, um, which is that last term in the energy equation that I said at the beginning of class we will often neglect for laminar flow. All right, we've got U star, partial T star, partial X star plus V star, partial T star, partial Y star, equals 1 over <coughs> the Reynolds number times the Prandtl number, which is a new dimensionless parameter that shows up when we plug in the dimensionless variables into the energy, energy equation, <coughs> times the second derivative of T <coughs> star with respect to Y star. <coughs> the boundary conditions. We're going to have the temperature at the wall. Remember, this is the dimensionless temperature. So it's basically just saying that the temperature at the, um, the temperature of the fluid at the surface is equal to the temperature of the surface. So their difference is equal to zero. And then in the free stream, 
the temperature of the fluid is equal to the ambient fluid temperature, which if you look back at the definition of the dimensionless temperature, just means that um, this, sorry, this should be T star, just, mean, just means that this temperature is equal to one. So this is just saying that the temperature of the fluid at the surface is equal to the surface temperature and in the free stream is equal to the free stream temperature. It's got some variation between those two. And it's equal to zero and one, the dimensionless temperature is just because of the way we defined the dimensionless temperature. All right, so the temperature boundary conditions at the wall and the free stream. And then the similarity parameters that show up in these equations. are the Reynolds number, which we defined previously, and the Prandtl number, which is equal to kinematic viscosity, nu, divided by alpha, the thermal diffusivity. And we'll talk about kind of what these parameters mean physically a little bit later. Yeah. Um, it's K over rho CP. We talked about it kind of in the beginning of the course, and it's basically how well the material um, conducts energy versus how well it stores it. Yeah. Or rho CP over K. I can't remember right now, but it's in the notes. <clears throat> Okay, and I'm going to mention this now, but we'll talk about it a little bit more, why these dimensionless parameters are so important. Um, and this is kind of like a key discovery, in I don't know if it's discovery is the right word, um, but like a really kind of significant um, uh, tool used in uh, fluid dynamics especially. And so the idea is if you have these similarity parameters that relate kind of different aspects of the fluid. And you have, let's say, kind of one, consider like one geometry. And you have a set of similarity parameters that apply to that geometry and a set of boundary conditions. And you do an experiment and you get some results. And then you take that geometry and you change the scale of it. You make it way bigger way smaller, you change the scale of the um, velocity, so you like increase the speed, decrease the speed, you change the fluid, use, I don't know, oil instead of water or something. Um, as long as the similarity parameters at the new scale and the boundary conditions are the same, the velocity and temperature fields will be identical in the dimensionless space. Does that make any sense? Try saying it again. So if you have, basically think about in the dimensionless space for now. Keep your mind there. Okay, so you've got a geometry, flat plate, whatever. You're doing an experiment. You've got some flow over it with water. And you have, you can calculate what the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number are of this experiment. They're just based on the fluid properties. And you get some results. You know what the velocity profile is, the temperature profile is. You can calculate the friction coefficient, the convection coefficient. And then you say, okay, cool. This is, these results are nice, but I wanted to actually know what was going on at like, you know, a thousand times this size. I have a plate that's gonna be a thousand times longer than this. And I wanna know what the, what the fluid is gonna do on that like giant plate. But it's really hard to test that in the lab because it's enormous, <coughs> right? So if you have results at your small scale and then at the big scale, as long as the similarity parameters, this Reynolds number and Prandtl number are the same and the boundary conditions are the same, the dimensionless velocity and temperature distributions will be identical. So 
the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, just because they're, just, they're, they're the same, doesn't mean that the fluid properties have to be the same. They're ratios of fluid properties, right? So at a small scale, you could have one Reynolds number, and then at a large scale, you could have the same Reynolds number, but have like totally different velocity, totally different temperature, as long as the ratios of all those properties give you the same dimensionless parameters. And this is incredibly important for fluids and heat transfer because it enables you to take results that you have at a smaller scale and know exactly what your answer is going to be at a way different scale without doing the experiments or the calculations. There's restrictions to that, <laughs> but ideally, <laughs> ideally, if the similarity parameters and the um, boundary conditions are the same. You can use totally different fluid, totally different scale, and you'll have the same dimensionless velocity and temperature distributions. So if you know, okay, at the small scale, I know my di dimensionless velocity and temperature distributions, so then they're the same at the large scale. If you want to know your actual velocity, right, not just dimensionless, it's pretty easy. You just multiply it by the, the characteristic scale and then you have your dimension, um, dimensional answers as well at the larger or smaller scale. Okay, I wanted to show you this and show you where kind of it all comes from, how you can dimensionalize these equations, these um, kind of dimensionless parameters fall out, and then what the power of using them can do, because it's a really, really important thing. Um, for fluids and heat transfer analysis and research. Okay. Does that make some sense? Okay, cool. Good. All right. Um, I'll try to summarize that. So we'll say if similarity parameters and boundary conditions are the same the dimensionless velocity and temperature distributions will be identical across scales, and this is important for a given geometry. So this only applies for geometric similarity, right? You can't like test a sphere and then say, oh, I have this giant flat plate. I'm gonna use these same answers, okay? Flat plate to flat plate, sphere to sphere. For a given geometry. Okay, and that's kind of the principle that all of these empirical correlations that we're going to learn are based on. So someone did a bunch of experiments on kind of spheres of different sizes and different fluids, different velocities, and was able to relate all of the um, results using these dimensionless parameters into like one equation that applies for one geometry across a bunch of different scales. Okay. So if we look at our dimensionless momentum equation, 
we can see that u star is a function of x star, y star, Reynolds number, and the pressure gradient. X, Y, pressure, Reynolds. This pressure distribution, we said, we're assuming it's the same in the boundary layer as it is in the free stream. We can obtain it from an independent consideration of the free stream conditions. So we often just assume that it's um, known. And it depends on the surface geometry. <laughs> so this is why these solutions and this kind of similarity method only works for one specific surface geometry or for a specified surface geometry because the pressure distribution depends on the surface geometry. So going forward, we're going to assume, okay, we're talking about a given geometry. So therefore, this pressure variation, um, this dpdx is no longer a variable. So for a given geometry, it's set, and we're just going to um, kind of drop it out. Okay, so given this, we now know, so we know what our definition of our shear stress is. This is the definition of the shear stress at the surface that we wrote down a couple days ago. And if we write it in dimensionless terms, We have something that looks kind of like the Reynolds number come up. So now if we want to write our friction coefficient, so basically we non-dimensionalize the governing equations and now we're just based on that doing the same thing to kind of these parameters that we're interested in. So now the friction coefficient using the non-dimensionalized velocity distribution looks like this. So the Reynolds number shows up in that as well, which is convenient. So that means we can calculate the friction coefficient from the Reynolds number. So we can calculate it across scales. So now we had this U star is equal to a function of all these things we're interested in du dy. So du star dy star we're just gonna divide out y so now we're left with this being a function of the x location, the Reynolds number, and the pressure distribution. And I mentioned that for a given geometry, the pressure distribution is constant. So we don't have to consider that anymore as long as we restrict ourselves to talking about one specified geometry. So now this dimensionless velocity profile is equal to, is a function of just two things. The x location, the dimensionless x location, and the Reynolds number. 
that means now our friction coefficient up here is equal to 2 over the Reynolds number times the dimensionless velocity profile, which is just a function of x star and the Reynolds number. So this is kind of our first result where we're saying, okay, this is something that we're interested in. We want to calculate the friction coefficient. And now we're able to express it in these dimensionless terms. So it's 2 over the Reynolds number times some function of x star and the Reynolds number. For a given geometry, if we can figure out what this function is equal to, then we'll be able to solve the friction coefficient at whatever scale we want for that geometry. So this function is going to be universal for different fluids, different velocities, different length scales. And we'll do, so we'll do the same thing with the temperature boundary layer now. And that'll get us um, kind of a more universal way of calculating the convection coefficient also. <clears throat> okay, so we can say this is universal for a given geometry. All right, we'll do the same thing from the energy equation. We know that this dimensionless temperature is equal to a function of a bunch of different things. Dimensionless x, y, Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and pressure gradient. Previously, we wrote down this definition of the, um, or a similar definition of the convection coefficient. And if we put it in dimensionless terms, it's equal to Kf over L times this dimensionless temperature gradient at the wall. So if you can see, we're heading in the same direction as we did with the friction coefficient. We're going to show that this h can be calculated using some function of dimensionless parameters that will be universal for a given geometry. OK, so that's h. And we're going to define this new parameter, Nusel number. because it's convenient. So we just rearrange this to isolate the dimensionless temperature distribution. So we say this Nusel number, which is defined as HL over KF, is now just going to be equal to dimensionless temperature distribution at the wall or at the surface. So now the Nusel number is a function of x star, the Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number. So that's because it's equal to this dimensionless temperature gradient. If we go back up here, dt dy, if we're dividing 3 by y, we're left with x star, Reynolds number, and Prandtl number. And then we said for a given geometry, it's the pressure distribution is constant. So we'll say for a given geometry here, so we can not worry about the pressure distribution. So this is kind of the 
it's a universal for a given geometry. So this is the same result that we had, similar result as we had for the um, friction coefficient. So now we have this Neusel number, which given the length and thermal conductivity allows us to calculate H, which usually those things are known. And the Neusel number is a function of just the dimensionless X location and these two dimensionless parameters, the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number, which can be calculated if you know your fluid properties. So then if the Neusel number is known, you can calculate H and then you can calculate the convection heat rate. So this is um, the Neusel number for an X location. So remember how we talked about we have the local and the average convection coefficients because the temperature gradient changes with X. Your H is going to change with X so you have H is a different value at a bunch of different locations. So this is saying you're specifying the Neusel number at this one X location. So it's a local Neusel number. So we'll say this is local. And then if we want to know the average Neusel number, So with a bar, so we can calculate the average convection coefficient over an entire surface. It's just equal to the average convection coefficient times L over the thermal conductivity. So then because you've integrated over a surface, it's no longer a function of a specific X location just the average Neusel number corresponding to the average convection coefficient for an entire surface. It's just a function of these two dimensionless parameters, the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. So we basically reduced um, the dependency of H from like seven different dimensional variables down to just three dimensionless groups. So the Neusel number, Reynolds number, and Prandtl number. We're just talking about it in terms of those three dimensionless groups. All right, so a little summary. The dimensionless parameters that we either uncovered or defined. The Neusel number, the Reynolds number, and the Prandtl number. These are the relevant parameters for low speed forced convection. And that just goes back to the fact that when we initially set up our mass, momentum, and energy equations, we applied assumptions that are true in low speed force convection. We assumed it was laminar flow, so we neglected viscous dissipation. We said we were in the boundary layer, so we can neglect all these gradients. So there's no body forces because it's force convection. And that kind of the end result is that these three dimensionless parameters are the relevant properties or the relevant parameters for low speed force convection. And I know I always say this, but I think it is especially true in convection that we're gonna have a bunch of different equations, a bunch of different correlations, and you're gonna have to know that, you know, we're talking about a specific geometry. So this is the function that gives you the Neusel number for a sphere in free convection, or this is the right correlation for a turbulent flat plate in um, you know, forced convection, or something like that. So we're gonna have a lot of different correlations and you really need to think about and remember which assumptions go into them and when you can apply them and when you can't.
So the next couple chapters really go through kind of solving specifically for what this function is equal to for the friction coefficient and the Neusel number for a ton of different applications and scenarios. And that'll allow us to calculate the convection coefficient. Okay, any questions? All right, I think I'll stop there. That's a pretty good ending spot. Um, I do want to mention that um, I am posting homework five today. If you're confused, start with the first law, okay? Always kind of a good principle, but especially on this homework, if you don't know where to start, start by applying the first law. Um, and remember to use the given fine in solution format. Okay, we're well into the quarter by now. We're gonna start taking off points. We have started taking off points if you're not doing that. So please do that. It makes grading easier and it's just a formal way to present your work. Okay, thanks.